welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're discussing the heresies that have surfaced throughout the history of the Church, and today we'll talk about Catharism. In the 11th and 12th centuries, a group called the Cathars emerged, named after the Greek word katharos, which means pure. If you want to understand what made the Cathar faith what it was, the best answer would be the belief that there is a principle of good and one of evil, each represented by its own god. The good god created the invisible and spiritual universe, while the evil god produced the material world. If this is starting to sound familiar to you, it should. All of this is nothing more or less than millennia-old Gnosticism under a different name. There are, of course, disputes about whether the Cathars should even be considered Christian. If you're using the word Christian to refer to anyone who believes that God exists and that Jesus is God, then you could say that they are Christian after a fashion. However, there's no denying that the Cathars flat out rejected the first and most primary commandment of Christianity and even of Old Covenant Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, and with thy whole soul, and with thy whole strength. Deuteronomy 6, 4-5 In any case, the Cathars began taking up names associated with the places they lived, which is where the Albigensians came from. Don't let the media fool you on this point, though. The Albigensians were not a bunch of peaceful farmers who wanted to be left alone. They stormed through European territories, burning churches and killing innocent Catholics. And it's important to keep in mind that, for the governments of the time, open violence of this sort, especially on religious grounds, was considered the same as a rebellion against them. At the time, holding the same religion as your king or lord was basically taken for granted out of loyalty, and attacking the religion that your king or lord honored was seen as an act of betrayal against the government. For this reason, the governments of the time were chomping at the bit to put down this insurrection, and as always, the Catholic Church did its best to intervene, to act with love even towards its mortal enemies. Emissaries were sent to the Albigensians on behalf of Pope Innocent III to try to settle the matter. However, those emissaries were killed by the Albigensians and never returned to Rome to report what had happened. From a purely political point of view, the situation was intolerable. From a Catholic point of view, it was even less so, since the Cathars were not only attacking the innocent, but preaching falsehoods, and even trying to ally themselves with major leaders in the Muslim world against Christianity. In the end, the secular governments came down on the Cathars, and like most violent rebellions, they were stopped by the established governing body. Of course, many of their errors continued on in one form or another, but at least you won't see a horde of torch-wielding savages riding over the hills to attack you tomorrow for being a Christian. At least, I don't think you will. So, wait. If the Cathars were such evil dudes, why do you hear so much about all the horrible, unjustified things the Church did to them? Well, the sad truth is that modern man has been spending the last hundred or so years writing, among other things, revisionist history to try to make the Catholic Church look monstrous and bloodthirsty when, most of the time, the limited military actions of Catholics were done in an attempt to defend the innocent, and I may do episodes touching on the Crusades one of these days. Now, it's time for our biggest jump yet. We'll be skipping over almost 500 years of history to witness a powerful advance in technology and what followed from it. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.